In this video, we're going to take a look at the third race conditions lab on Portswigger's Web Security Academy. The lab is called Multi Endpoint Race Conditions. There's quite a lot of material in this lab, so I want to jump straight into it. But let me just first say if you are not familiar with race conditions, it's worth going and checking the previous labs or the previous videos. And if you've already read through this theory stuff in your own time, you can just jump straight to the chapter where we go into the practical lab. All right, so hidden multi step sequences. In practice, a single request may initiate an entire multi step sequence behind the scenes, transitioning the application through multiple hidden states that it enters and exits again before request processing is complete. We'll refer to these as substates. If you can identify one or more HTTP requests that cause an interaction with the same data, you can potentially abuse these substates to expose time sensitive variations of the kind of logic flaws that are common in multi step workflows. This enables race condition exploits to go far beyond the limit of overruns. For example, you may be familiar with flawed multi factor authentication workflows that let you perform the first part of a login using known credentials, but then navigate straight to the application via forced browsing, effectively bypassing MFA entirely. The following pseudocode demonstrates how a website could be vulnerable to a race variation of this attack. As you can see in the code snippet, this is in fact a multi-step sequence within the span of a single request. Most importantly, it transitions through a substate in which the user temporarily has a valid logged in session, but MFA isn't yet being enforced. An attacker could potentially exploit this by sending a login request along with a request to a sensitive authenticated endpoint. We'll look at some more examples of hidden multi-step sequences later and we'll be able to practice exploiting them in Port Swigger's labs. However, as these vulnerabilities are quite application specific, it's important to understand the broader methodology you'll need to apply in order to identify them efficiently, both in labs and in the wild. And just to summarize what happened in this code snippet, so whenever we log in, it's first giving us a valid session, and then it's gonna check if MFA is enabled, and if so, it's gonna enforce MFA. But we know that using race conditions, we could send multiple requests at the same time. So we could send a request to say that we want to log in and we get the valid session, but then before it's able to check if MFA is enabled, we then try to access some authenticated endpoint, maybe like slash admin or slash user or something like that. And if we get that timing right, if we time the race windows correctly and everything aligns, then it'll mean that that request to the admin or user endpoint occurs before we need to use MFA. To detect and exploit hidden multi-step sequences, Portswigger recommends the following methodology, which is summarized from the white paper by James Kettle. And again, there's also plenty of talks on YouTube that you can follow, like the DEF CON talk where he covered this stuff. And that process is predict, probe, and then prove. So the first stage of this methodology is predict potential collisions. Testing every endpoint is impractical. After mapping out a target site as normal, you can reduce the number of endpoints you need to test by asking yourself the following questions. One, is the endpoint security critical? Many endpoints don't touch critical functionality, so they're not even worth testing. And two, is there any collision potential? For a successful collision, you typically need two or more requests that trigger operations on the same record. For example, consider the following variations of a password reset implementation. With the first example, Requesting parallel password resets for two different users is unlikely to cause a collision as it results in changes to two different records. However, the second implementation enables you to edit the same record with requests for two different users. The second stage of the methodology is probe for clues. So let's say we've just predicted a potential collision. To recognize clues, we'll first need to benchmark how the endpoint behaves under normal conditions. We can do this in the burp repeater by grouping all our requests and then sending as a group in sequence using separate connections. Next, send the same group of requests at once using a single packet attack or the last byte sync if HTTP2 isn't supported and that will minimize the network jitter. You can do this in burp repeater by selecting the send group in parallel option. Alternatively, we can use Turbo Intruder, which is available from the burp app store. Anything at all can be a clue. Just look for some form of deviation from what you observe during the benchmarking. This includes a change in one or more responses, but don't forget second order effects like different email contents or a visible change in the application's behavior afterwards. And finally, we need to prove the concept. So we need to try and understand what's happening, remove the superfluous requests, and make sure you can still replicate the effects. 
Advanced race conditions can cause unusual and unique primitives, so the path to maximum impact isn't always immediately obvious. It may help to think of each race condition as a structural weakness rather than an isolated vulnerability. Perhaps the most intuitive form of these race conditions are those that involve sending requests to multiple endpoints at the same time. Think about the classic logic flaw in online stores where you add an item to your basket, pay for it, and then add more items before force browse into the order confirmation page. A variation of this vulnerability can occur when payment validation and order confirmation are performed during the processing of a single request. The state machine for the order status might look something like this, where we have a basket, we make a post request to make payment, and then the payment is validated before the basket is confirmed. In this case, you can potentially add more items to the basket during a race window between when the payment is validated and when the order is finally confirmed. When testing for multi endpoint race conditions, you may encounter issues trying to line up the race windows for each request, even if you send them all at exactly the same time using a single packet technique. This common problem is primarily caused by two factors. Delays introduced by network architecture, for example, there may be a delay whenever the front-end server establishes a new connection to the back-end. The protocol used can also have a major impact. And secondly, delays introduced by endpoint-specific processing. So different endpoints inherently vary in their processing times, sometimes significantly so, depending on what operations they trigger. Fortunately, there are potential workarounds to both of these issues. And that brings us to connection warming. Backend connection delays don't usually interfere with race condition attacks because they typically delay parallel requests equally, so the requests stay in sync. It's essential to be able to distinguish these delays from those caused by endpoint specific factors. One way to do this is by warming the connection with one or more inconsequential requests to see if it smooths out the remaining processing times. In Burp Repeater, you can try adding a GET request to the home page to the start of your tab group and then send group in sequence using a single connection. If the first request still has a longer processing time, but the rest of the requests are now processed within a short window, you can ignore the apparent delay and continue testing as normal. If you still see inconsistent response times on a single endpoint, even when using a single packet technique, this is an indication that the backend delay is interfering with your attack. You may be able to work around this by using Turbo Intruder to send some connection warming requests before following up with your main attack requests. If connection warming doesn't make any difference, there are various solutions to the problem. Using Turbo Intruder, you can introduce a short client-side delay. However, as this involves splitting your actual attack results across multiple TCP packets, you won't be able to use a single packet attack technique. As a result, on high jitter targets, the attack is unlikely to work reliably, regardless of what delay you set. Instead, you may be able to solve this problem by abusing a common security feature. Web servers often delay the process of requests if too many are sent too quickly. By sending a large number of dummy requests to intentionally trigger the rate or resource limit, you may be able to cause a suitable server-side delay. This makes a single packet attack viable even when delayed execution is required. All right, theory stuff out of the way, let's have a look at the lab. It's called Multi Endpoint Race Conditions, and the description says, this lab's purchasing flow contains a race condition that enables us to purchase items for an unintended price. To solve the lab, we need to purchase a lightweight leak leather jacket, and we've been given some credentials to log in with. We're warned that we need to use Burp 2023, September or higher. And they give us a tip that we should purchase gift cards because we can use those to avoid running out of store credit. Okay, so let us open up the lab. And we'll start by going to log in to the account. I want to say as well that I actually solved this lab quite quickly, but I went back and looked at the official solution afterwards and realized I didn't really follow this three-stage methodology that we should be learning. So I'm going to go through the official solution. And then at the end, I'll just talk through how I solved it without that predict, probe, and prove approach. All right, so the first thing is we want to go and see what the standard flow looks like whenever we try to purchase something. We can't afford the elite leather jacket, so let us go for the gift card, and that means if we need more money, we can redeem this. I'm going to add it to the cart, and then I'm going to go to the cart, and then we'll just click place order. All right, the order's placed, we've been given this code, and now we can go and have a look at the request and see what actually happened. And in doing this, we'll notice that we had a post to cart, which had the product ID, it redirected to product and the quantity was one. And then we have the post to cart checkout, which just has a CSRF token. 
Since we're on the predict phase, we want to try and work out whether a collision is likely here. And one of the ways we can do that is try and work out how our cart is stored and what it's tied to. So we want to add this to our cart again. I'm just going to send this to the repeater. This was the request to add that voucher. We'll send that again. And then let's also grab the get request to cart. Send that to repeater. And if we click send and then have a look through this, we should now have one item in the cart which you can see down here is the gift card. And what we want to do is try and take out the session cookie. Let's see if we just send that off and have a look. And now we don't have access to the car. So what that is telling us is that the state of the car is stored server side in our session and any operations on the car will be keyed onto the session ID. And that does indicate a potential collision. We should also notice that whenever we made the successful purchase, it was also part of a single request response cycle. And that creates the opportunity for a race condition. So there may be a race window between when the order is validated and when the order is confirmed. All right, our next step then was to probe. Now that we think we might have found a potential collision, we want to probe it. I'm going to go back to the repeater. What do we have here? We've got the get cart. I'm going to get rid of that. So we've got our post cart. And then we also want to have the post cart checkout. We'll send this to repeater as well. And then we can go ahead and create a new group. So I'll create a group, I'll just call it race and give it a color, add both of these tabs. And we wanna do what we saw in the guide then, in the methodology. So the first thing was to send this as a sequence over a single connection. And we can do this a few times. We wanna send the group through. The only thing is it's going to change the quantity of our car each time we do that. And we're interested in the difference in the response times in this. Let us actually add to the cart again. So this was, oh, we're actually, we're adding it to the cart here. Okay, so we add one to the cart and then we're doing our checkout, so that's fine. Let's do that again, single connection. And we can actually have a look and see this came back in 441 milliseconds. The second one came back in 137. Let's do that again, 424. And the second one was 82. So there's quite a discrepancy between the two requests. And the thing that we learned about was warming the connection. So to do that, we could potentially add a request to the home page here. Let me just create a new one. Make a request to the home page, and then I'm just going to close it. Let's go back to Burp and let us send that to the repeater. And we'll add that to our group as well. So now we're going to send three requests. The first one is basically warming the connection. And if we do that now, the first one takes 462 milliseconds. The second one takes 108. And the third one takes 128. So we can try that again and see the first one was 424. The second is 89 and the third is 174. So essentially we added that inconsequential request at the beginning, just making a call to the homepage and that warms the connection, meaning that the time between the second and third requests was a lot smaller, it created a smaller window. And this is an indication that the delay is caused by the backend network architecture rather than the respective processing time of each endpoint, and therefore it's not likely to interfere with the attack. And finally, before we prove our concept, we want to just try and find out, again, we're benchmarking, so we want to try and find out what happens when we change the ID of this product. We can go back and have a look, but I know that the ID is one for the light weather, for the light leather jacket, or the elite leather jacket, whatever it's called. And I'm going to change this and hopefully, even though it doesn't matter that these are not in the order that we want them to occur in, because actually we want this to change after we make the purchase, but we'll be sending all of these as a single packet anyway, so it doesn't matter the ordering. For now, let's just do it with this one and let's see what response we get back. If we go to our, it'll be this one, right? So we need to follow our redirection and then have a look. And it says not enough store credit for this purchase. So that was exactly as we expected. Let's go back on that one. Let me also go back and change this to, actually, I'm gonna go and do this manually just so we don't have to change our group at all. Let's go back to the home page, And actually I need to remove the leather jacket. We'll remove that and then we'll go and add a, no, I don't wanna add that one. I wanna add the gift card, add to cart. There we go, it's in the car. Let's try this again, but now we're gonna prove the concept. So we're gonna send this all as a single packet attack and let's send in parallel. And there we go, we've solved the lab. So just a very quick recap of what happened there. We had the gift card in our cart and we purchased the gift card using this request here, post checkout. But at the same time, we sent another packet, another request 
which changed the product ID, or which added the, it didn't change it because we still had the gift card there, but it added the expensive leather jacket to the cart. And we basically exploited that race window. So in between the time of it checking the cart and then actually making the purchase, we were able to update the cart's contents. Okay, I wanted to talk through how I originally solved the lab without really following that methodology. I tried to reset the lab, but again, there isn't actually any way to reset the lab. So we just have to keep working on the one that we're in at the moment. But basically what I did, well, we'll go and log in again. Oh, we're still logged in. Don't need to do that. Um, the first thing that I was looking at was basically purchasing the gift card. Let's go back. Let's go to home gift card and we can add it to the cart, go to our cart. And I was trying to do something similar, but what I was trying to do is in between the, well, we place the order and then at the same time, we want to update the quantity of the gift card. It didn't actually work, but the error that I got at the time was due to an invalid quantity which I believe might be because I used a thousand. Maybe if we change it to like a hundred or something, it will work. So why don't we give it a go? I don't know if it's even gonna let me purchase that now because I'm at minus. No, okay, um, not great for the demo. Well, I'm sure you get the idea anyway. You can try this yourself and see if it works. Essentially, we have a quantity of one. We go to place order and then we'll line up those requests in a group again. So we'll have the request to post the cart. Let me send that to the repeater and I already closed down this group because I thought I'd be able to reset the lab but I can't. So we would send this through, we'd have the group and let me actually add them to the group now just so this is a bit clearer. So the quantity is currently one, say we've got one in our cart and we could then change this and say we want the quantity to be a hundred and we send the group at once. So it's trying to it first verifies that we can afford the one coupon. And then in between that verification and the actual purchase of the order, it increased the quantity to 100. So yeah, that didn't work for me, but I think it should work. It's probably just because I used 1,000 and it's not a valid quantity maybe based on the limit. So try and do that with 100 or 999. It might be limited to three digits or something, or maybe two digits. You can try 99 and see if that works. Since that didn't work for me, I kind of did what we did in the official solution. The only difference is I didn't make that benign call to the home page. The reason being I was trying to automate this. So what I basically had this doing was I had this set to one and then let us also send this again to the repeater. And then I had this one set to product ID one. So my idea was that it would essentially add a gift card to the cart and then it would make the purchase and then we would change the quantity. And that just means that if it didn't work, I wouldn't have to go and manually add the gift card to the cart again, like we did in the official solution. However, I didn't realize that the unintended consequence of that was that it warmed up the connection, meaning that these two were closer together. The window between them was a lot shorter, meaning it worked. So it was kind of a fluke. Anyway, I'll try to keep the conclusion short because this is already going to be a long video and I don't think Port Sugar will like it if all of the videos are like 20 minutes or longer. So I just want to say it's always worth checking the official solution. Even if you solve one of these challenges and you think, yeah, I know I know exactly how to do it. You'll quite often learn something new from checking the official solution afterwards. It's always worth doing. And in the next video, we're going to look at the single endpoint race conditions lab. And finally, as always, let me recommend that you sign up to the Integrity platform if you're interested in finding vulnerabilities like this and getting paid for it. A side note, if you do happen to find a race condition vulnerability and get it accepted, I would be very interested to hear about it. So you can send me a message on Twitter or Discord or something like that. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, as ever, leave them down below. Thanks.